you made it through. Parallel lines, perpendicular lines, equations of lines, slopes of lines. We did all that in the last few sessions, and now we're going to uh, work some problems by way of review. In fact, that's all we're going to do. So let's do it. Now here's one that uh, would be nice to see on your standardized exam. So they kind of did you a favor here. It never crosses the y-axis. Well, what does that mean? Hmm. Well, two lines that never cross each other are either skew or parallel. Now, we're drawing this on our coordinate plane, which means that the y-axis and the line that we draw are going to be in the same plane, and if they don't cross, they'll be parallel, which means they have the same slope. What is the slope of the y-axis? Remember, it's undefined. But there is only one unique angle which is undefined, and that's this one here. Everything else is defined. So, undefined isn't quite as impossible as it sounds. Well, it's going to be a straight line. That means the x-coordinate is going to be the same. Just straight up and down. For instance, a horizontal line. That means that the y-coordinate never changes, and the x-coordinate could be anything. Here, the x-coordinate never changes, but the y-coordinate goes up and down. So, first we got to find one of these points that starts with a 3, because that's going to have to be the same. Let's see, we got it. Oh, well, <laughs> we're done right there. That's it. And if we plug it in, it makes perfect sense. There's 3, 2, and the line, that uh, little segment connecting these two points, or the line that passes through those two points. is parallel to the y-axis, which was the requirement. So, I spent more time on that than I should have. <laughs> if this was on a test, as a student, you would probably do this in about 20 seconds. Just recognize that it doesn't cross the y-axis. It must be another vertical line. Vertical line would have to have the same x-coordinate. Ah, there it is. All done. Hey, another one of those easy multiple choice questions. Which one is the equation of a line parallel to this line? Well, first we just have to know the slope of this line. So we can rewrite this as 3y equals 2x plus 15, or y equals 2 thirds x plus 15. There's, wow, that's not 2 thirds. Come on. Here we go. 2 thirds x. This 2 thirds just has to match up got to have another one with a slope of two-thirds, so it'll be parallel, minus, minus three-halves, well, plus two-thirds, well, there it is, right there. We are all done. That's all you had to do. Get your slope, match it up, and you're done. Now, here we have the classic train problem, except these trains aren't leaving one from Chicago and one from San Francisco, like the classic 100-year-old problem they used to put in. Student math books. This is pretty close, though. We've got two trains on parallel tracks, 110 miles long. So doesn't hurt to go ahead and draw a little picture there. Is we'll just pretend those are two parallel tracks. <laughs> wow. Anyway, they're 110 miles long. So we got here and here. They're each 110. So at the end here, it's 110 each way. I mean, for both of them. Now we got train E here. They don't say that it starts here and has a 110 mile trip. I'm assuming that's what they mean. I mean, the track's 110 miles long, there's nothing saying you don't have a station right here that you take off from, and maybe this one took off from here. In which case, you probably couldn't really even answer the question. So let's pretend that they start at the beginning of their 110 mile track. What we're going to do is set up an equation. It'll 
tell us when this train gets to the end of the line. In other words, it has completed its trip. And that's easy to do. Remember? We have the miles per hour. And we have the time. So if we want to know how long it's going to take, all we have to do we divide the number of miles which we need to travel. That's by right in the units it'd be more obvious. Divided by fifty-five miles per hour. Oh, I shouldn't have put the I in there. That was dumb. Let's just scratch that out. Yeah. Remember the miles cancel. This is the fraction in the denominator, so we can flip it and make it hours over miles. The miles cancel, and we get two hours. That's how long it takes trainee to get to the end of the uh, track here. Real easy. Now we're traveling at 22 miles per hour. How many miles will have left when it when train E completes his trip, how many miles will train F have left to go? Well, that's easy. All we have to do is figure out how far train F would travel in two hours. So we've got 22 miles an hour times two. I'll go ahead and write it out just so you can see the dimensions. Two hours times 22 miles per hour. See how the hours cancel, and you get 44 miles. That's how far he's traveled. Put him right here somewhere. How far does he have left to go? Well, all we have to do is take one ten. subtract 44. And if I didn't make another dumb arithmetic mistake, I get 66. And that's one of the choices. I think I've mentioned about a hundred times before, <laughs> don't get too heartened just because the answer you got is one of the choices, because the people who make these tests are really good at figuring what common mistakes you will make, <laughs> and then sticking those in there too. For instance, I'm surprised they didn't put 44 in here, because that would be an easy thing to do. As you compute how far you've actually gone, you get to the 44, you might notice a 44 up here, and grab it. Completely forget that you need to subtract that from 110 because they asked how many miles you have left to complete and not how many miles you have completed. But they didn't do that. But it, it's my general rule on all tests expect to be deceived. Actually, that works out in most situations. Yeah, okay, this one would be kind of confusing if you don't think about it. It's parallel to the y-axis, so I just went ahead and drew in a quick little xy. Yeah, I probably should have drawn arrows on these things. I've got a bad habit of not doing that. Here's y and x. we got something parallel to the y-axis. That just means it's vertical. And it's got a 0.36 here. And I just drew it as a dotted line because we don't know what segment it is we're looking for yet. We just know that there is a segment that is nine units long. Because without this information that is nine units long, any one of these could be right. If you just draw a vertical line, the x coordinate will have to be three. The y coordinate could be anything. Except that we know it's nine units long. So if we go up nine, that'll put us at fifteen up here. So fifteen is one possibility but they didn't put it here. Suppose we went down 9. Well, that would put us at minus 3. Oh, and that one 
is there. So you see, again, it was real easy. Uh, probably didn't even need to draw this. I just went ahead and sketch it out real quick so you can see what we're talking about here. Okay, here we are working with slopes again. Now I want to know which equation is an equation of a line perpendicular to y equals 5x. So what's the slope of this line? It's 5. What's the slope of the perpendicular? Remember, if you have a line m, uh, pardon me, a line with slope m, what's the slope of the perpendicular? It's minus 1 over m, right? So minus 1 over 5 would be, have to be the slope. So we've got to find something with that slope in it. Well, there's one. Any others? Nope. I guess we can stop right there. There are many, many equations of a line perpendicular to a given line. All you have to do is find one with the right slope. And this part over here, no matter what you put here, will still be perpendicular. It just moves the line up and down in the plane, that's all. A higher y-intercept means the plane is the line is going up. A lower y-intercept means the line is going down. But it's still going to be perpendicular. There's another nice easy one. This, all you have to do here is understand how to interpret a graph. And they're asking you uh, the closest approximation to the decrease in sales between week 4 and week 5. And I just look down here, where is week 4 and 5? Oh, here we go. Wow. Let's see, it looks to me like it was about 25 here and 5 here. So, I would say that's a drop of 20. See? Real easy. All you have to do is just understand how to interpret this little graph here where they plotted points for you. That's a big drop. Maybe they were trying a, a new promotional program. They give away a three-legged cat with every sale. Probably drops sales quite a bit. Now here's one that uh, well, it looks kind of complicated, doesn't it? Which pair of angles have equal measures? Well, she is. We got slightly less than a dozen angles here to make sense out of. Well, the quickest way is probably not to identify every single pair of congruent angles. I mean, these two are congruent, these two, these two, they're, they're all over the place. Let's just take a look at uh, some of the answers down here see if we find one that makes sense. It might be a quicker way to do it, like angle 3 and angle 5. Oh, those are supplementary. They're not congruent. How about 4 and 7? Well, it almost looks like they're alternate angles, doesn't it? But they're not. <laughs> it's their, this transversal over here, like uh, this angle this angle here and this angle would be, but these two, no, nah, there's just no relationship. There's no obvious relationship between this one and this one. At least I don't see one. If we don't find an obvious relationship between any of them, we'll have to go back and double check and see if we perhaps have missed a connection. What about angle 1 and 9? Well, let's see here. This is the same transversal and one yeah I don't see anything wrong with saying that one and nine are corresponding angles forget this transversal here so you got two parallel lines this is the transversal and nine and one would be corresponding angles and they are congruent so I would say that's it. We can double check and see how this, this makes any sense. What about angle 2 and angle 6? No. They kind of look like corresponding angles, don't they? But we're talking about two completely different transversals. These are not two parallel lines. So, I'd go with C. 1 and 9, they look like corresponding angles to me, and that would make them congruent. 
There's another one of those where they, uh, there's a bunch of stuff going on here. It's tempting to get confused, but let's not get confused. Let's see if we can figure out what's really going on here. For instance, if we just consider A and C, forget about the middle part here, we've got this transversal, and these two angles, well, they look like corresponding angles to me. That means x equals 55. That is the measure of angle x. Uh, it is 55. And what about the measure of angle y? Hmm. Well, angle y is not congruent to this angle. This angle over here would be congruent to this. These two would be corresponding. Now we're just considering this parallel line and this parallel line and this transversal. We do it that way. Let's see if I can draw it in. Got this one, this one, and then this transversal. So this angle and this angle would be congruent. However, this angle would of course be supplementary to this angle. These two would form a linear pair. That means this angle and this one are supplementary, or measure of angle y plus 70 equals 180, or this equals 110. Yes, 180 minus 70 is 110. We add 55 to that. Is that over here anywhere? Mm, there we go. All you had to do was to you know, recognize your, your corresponding, you know, just keep track of your parallel lines and your transversals, which angles are congruent and which angles are supplementary. That's pretty much the whole deal with parallels and transversals. You form eight angles and the whole bunch is either Anytime you grab two angles, they're pretty much always either congruent or supplementary. Here's a couple more slope questions. I bet you just fly right through this. What is the slope of a line perpendicular to 5x minus 3y? First, let's figure out what the slope of this line is. And we can write that as 3y, add 3y to each side, subtract 9, and we get 5x minus 9, or y equals 5 over 3x minus 3. And I just went ahead and wrote this out. It wasn't necessary. If you're doing this on a test and you're in a hurry, just find the slope. You can forget about whatever this turns out to be. It has no effect on the actual problem. We know the slope of this line now is 5 over 3. So the line perpendicular, remember, it's the negative reciprocal, which is just minus 3 over 5. So that would be our answer right here, minus minus 3 over 5. Not too bad. Here's another one I would really like to see on a standardized test. You could probably, you know, if you think about it, just glance at it and figure out the answer. It's either going to be 1 or minus 1. How do you know that? Well, it's the rise over the run, correct? the ratio of <coughs> the change in the rise over the change in the run. Well, we got our x coordinates here. Say x is 1. The other x coordinate is minus 2. Here y is 1. The other y coordinate is minus 2. In other words, they changed exactly the same way. If that happens, then the ratio is going to turn out to be 1, right? Well, let's, let's prove it. We'll call this one p2 and this one p1. So we have minus 2 minus 1 over 
minus 2, minus 1. And it's minus 3 over minus 3. So it's 1 because they changed exactly the same way. If this were a plus 2, that wouldn't be true. <laughs> but since they changed exactly the same way, we have a slope of 1. Now when they say, what is the y-intercept, especially in something like this, it means what you're going to do is find an equation of the line in slope-intercept form. That way, the mx plus b, the b is your y-intercept. So, you know, it's usually like that, of course. So all we have to do is find a line parallel to this line that passes through this point. write the equation in the slope-intercept form, and b will be our answer. What's the slope of this line? Well, let's see here. If we just add y to each side, subtract 3, we get 2x minus 3 equals y. Just doing that real quick because when we move this over here, it's obvious that this isn't going to change. So, m equals 2. And we're looking for a parallel line, so we're going to keep the same slope. So, we know it passes through the point minus 3, 4. So now all we have to do is use that information. If y is 4, Six, we add it to each side, and I think we get that b equals 10. So, our y-intercept is 10. That's all they asked for. They didn't ask you for the whole equation, just the y-intercept. That's because they're sneaky. They don't have to ask you for the equation. They know you're going to have to compute the equation <laughs> to get to the y-intercept. So they just ask you for that part, knowing you're going to have to do all this to get to it. Sneaky, right? And here we're going to use our transversal properties once again. And let's see here. Are we given that we have parallel lines? Yes. J is parallel to K. That helps a lot. So what do we know? Well, this angle and this angle here would be congruent. They'd be corresponding angles, wouldn't they? And this angle and this angle are supplementary. So. This angle must be supplementary to 125. So we have 125 plus A equals 180. And with a little bit of arithmetic, we get that A equals 55. Now this is 125 here, we know that. And this is the supplement, or <coughs> 55. Again, pretty easy. How do you know that lines M and N are parallel? Well, it's easy to see that this angle and this angle are supplementary. They form a linear pair. And they add up to 180. This angle here must be 180 minus 35, which would be, uh, I think, 145, right? Now, we have this angle and this angle are equal. And how do we know M and N are parallel? Well, that's our corresponding angles converse theorem. The corresponding 
corresponding angles theorem is that if the two lines are parallel and cut by a transversal, the corresponding angles are equal. The converse is, if the corresponding angles are equal, when they're cut by a transverse, then the two lines must be parallel. And that's the one we use to, it says explain. I mean, that's, okay, I guess that's an explanation. It's almost a proof. Well, here we go. I don't remember a definition of the word between. It's possible we gave one. I don't remember it. I'll give it to you now. If you've got two points, I mean, if you got a point here and a point here, what's between these two points? Well, I would say the segment, which has these two points as endpoints, anything lying on that segment could be defined as being between these two points. That would be my mathematical definition of between. You could say it lies on the segment connecting these two points. Oh, okay. Now it's between 2, 2, and 2, 3. So if I were to draw something real quick here, this is my another, another one of those bad XY drawings there. Well, what have we got? We got the point 1, 1 here. And it passes between 2, 2, and it's down here, and 2 minus 3. And I'm sorry, that was minus 2. Well, then that's completely wrong if they're both minus, isn't it? Over here. Minus 2, minus 2, it's down here. Minus 2, minus 3 is over here. Yeah, forget the points I started to draw over here. That was, that was a mistake. Well, if they're between these two points, these, these points lie in a vertical line. So, what we're saying is a slope anywhere from here to, say, here. They're just asking you to pick one. Well, I'm going to do this problem sort of generally. Not sort of. There, just smack myself in the head for saying that. That's sort of. It will be general. And what I'm going to do is take the slope from here to here, take the slope from here to here, and any number you came up with between those two would be okay. Makes sense to me. So either way, so we're just going to take this one to be our, uh, we'll say P2. This is P2 over here. This is like uh, P1 and P3 maybe. Doesn't matter. Maybe we'll just alternate. This will be P1 in one equation. Will be P. This will be P1 in another equation. So P2 minus this stuff is going to give us one minus a minus two. Over here is one minus a minus. And that, again, is 1. Okay, what about this one? Well, we have the same thing on the bottom. But let's see here. 1 minus a minus 3. That would be the rise. And 1 minus a minus 2. That's 4 over 3. And if you're looking for cents, well, this is a steeper slope, and this is a bigger number, so it makes sense. So the slope we're looking for, the answer to this question, m, well, it's greater than 1 and less than 4 thirds. We can't say, we can't put the equals in here m is greater than or equal to 1, because it says here that it, they don't pass through the point. They don't actually contain this point. 
a slope of 1 would contain this point, and a slope of 4 thirds would contain this point. But they excluded those two possibilities, so that's why we have the strict greater than sign here. Other than that, pretty easy. Well, this is another one of those set up the algebraic equation problems. Those are good because it's actually very realistic. You have to do this all the time. Uh, all kinds of situations. And business applications especially. That's kind of what this is. It's a watered down version of a business application. Well, we get uh, the nearby babysitter one next door who charges five dollars an hour and then Zachary charges four dollars an hour but you have to pay his bus fare which is three bucks so let's write out the equations for what it would cost to hire one or the other with H as the number of hours and F as the fee and of course we're going to write F the fee as a function of hours that I hope that's kind of intuitively obvious to you. The fee is going to depend, go up or down entirely according to what the hours go up or down. Now, F for Lauren, we'll say that F sub L. Well, that's just 5H, isn't it? Five times however many hours she works now. F sub Z, that's a little bit different. That's 4H plus 3. And represents the $3 transportation fee. Graph the equations you wrote. Now here's a graph of the two equations we laid out. This red line here is 5H, five five in this case. And this one is the 4H plus 3. Naturally, this one has a shallower slope. This one's steeper. So they will eventually intersect, and they do up here at... Uh, at what point is that? Looks like it's about the uh, three hour mark where they intersect. That's where it really doesn't matter financially which one you hire. And after some more algebra, we can come back and look at the graph again. Based on their fees, and I guess they mean only their fees, not just including the fees as part of the consideration. For instance, you know, maybe one cleans out the refrigerator every time and the other one doesn't. I would tend to factor that in. Well, if all you worry about is the fees and not which one is a better babysitter or the fact that the kid's always bleeding when you come home when one of them babysits, which would be the better choice? I think what they mean is, which one's cheaper? The cheaper one's not always the better one. Chances are, well, let's work it out. We can do that. At the two hour point, what would it be? Well, that's easy. This would be 10, right? Five times two. Boom. 10. This would be 8 plus 3. And that's 11. So, Lauren here's a slightly better deal for two hours. And that makes sense. If we check our graph, see if I can make it work with that. Oops. <laughs> there. And at the two hour point, you can see that they're not too far apart. But a little bit. This is, uh, let's see here. Nine and a half. And yeah. Yeah, it looks like they're about a dollar apart. Let's see if that's 
what the equation says. Yeah, and the equation says that they're a dollar apart. Looking good so far. What about four hours? Well, just draw it over here. Let's see. H equals four. F equals 20. That's the total fees so over here. H equals 4. And what do we get? 16 plus 3. 17. Well, that means this guy's cheaper. Theoretically. Of course, they're not telling you everything. Like, you get home late. Zachary might beg you for a ride home. The fact that you got to drive him home. <laughs> Factor that into the cost of having him for a babysitter. You'll get home late at midnight. It's too late to take a bus. I need a ride. So you give him a ride home. and You probably threw away whatever money you saved. Go with the kid next door. This graphical way of figuring out when you break even, when you come out ahead, and if you're working on this line, at which point, which choice to make at any given point. These kind of graphs are uh, very common. In fact, there's something called uh, linear programming, which uses lots of this stuff. You'll have a whole bunch of lines coming together, and the corners will usually tell you where the lines intersect. Well, corners will tell you where the lines intersect. Of course, that's what makes the corner. Those points where the lines intersect will frequently be places where the process is optimized. Or to put it another way, if you're looking for the optimized way to do things, it will exist at one of the corners. So all you have to do, instead of expecting inspecting the all possible combinations, you inspect the five or six that exist at corners, and you find your optimum result. I know that sounds really complicated. That's, that's some college stuff called linear programming. It's, uh, it's used a lot in business. It's very powerful. and has virtually nothing to do with this course, but it's something to look forward to as you're learning this stuff. It's one of, it's one of the things that you're going to apply it to. You'll, you'll be a whiz in business because you know how to make everything super efficient. See, super efficient is better than efficient, right? Pretty sure you can look that up. So, in true business fashion, we have decided that we're going to save a couple of bucks to get somebody from out of town instead of going with our next door neighbor who is probably going to give us dirty looks for the rest of the week when she finds out that we hired somebody from 10 miles away. Here we have the kind of problem which, when I see on the test, I usually skip it and go to the next one. If I have time, I'll come back and see if I can figure it out. It looks ugly, doesn't it? There's all kinds of lines and points and stuff going on here. Well, we'll just have to break it down one at a time, see if we can get through it. Here. Compare the slopes of AB and BC. What can you conclude? Well, okay. Let's compute the slopes of AB and BC. What do we have here? They've already written out most of the stuff for us. Let's just do the computation. computations. 6 minus 2. That's the slope for AB now. 4 minus 0, or 4. Well, that's a slope of 1, isn't it? Okay. What about this one? Let's try 8 minus 6. For 2 minus 4. That's 2, and that's negative 2, so we get minus 1. What does that tell us? Well, these two are negative reciprocals, which means AB is perpendicular to BC. So we can go like that now. We know that's true now. We can put our little right angle in there if we want to. So that's what we can conclude about ABC. It's a right angle. Now, if BCG is 45 degrees, where is BCG? Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, so that's this here. And this. 
That's 45. Okay. What is the CH? Well, I'm suspecting that, wait a minute, I don't even have to suspect it, do I? They tell us that these are parallel. <laughs> I was going to compute the slope and prove that this thing is a perpendicular to this, but we don't need to. They gave us that. AB is parallel to DC. That's these two. Now we have, remember our old theorem? We have a line perpendicular to another line. It's perpendicular to any line parallel to that line, which means this has to be perpendicular also. That's because this line and this line are parallel. And this is a perpendicular transversal be another way to look at it. And we know that we get right angles all the way around when they're cut with perpendiculars. So, this one's 90 degrees also. This one's 45 degrees. Why? Well, they just told us that. This is a straight angle. The whole thing has to add up to 180. We've got 90 here and 45 here. We're going to have to have 45 over here, aren't we? To to add up to 180. So, what is the angle of DCH? Well, I have a habit of explaining it before I give the answer, so I think we just explained it first. And the answer, of course, is 45. Notice this angle and this angle are equal. That's not a coincidence. The people who drew this obviously know something about physics. And what they know is the angle of incidence, the angle at which you comes into the wall, it's equal to the angle of reflection as long as the balls aren't spinning. If they're spinning that way or that way, that tends to change the angle at which it comes off. If there's no spin, this is, I think, called an elastic collision meaning, well, among other things, it means it doesn't spin. <laughs> For instance, light coming off a reflective surface, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. That's probably why they made this 45 and this 45. They're actually setting these up so that when you get to a physics class, the things you've learned here will make sense, or vice versa. It's not real important, I just thought I'd point it out to you. <laughs> You'll probably forget by the time you get to a physics class. But if you play pool, or handball, or racquetball, this little fact that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection can come in real handy. did for me, anyway. Let's see here. If the cue ball was hit harder, will it fall into pocket F? Ah, now there's... That's kind of a complicated question, isn't it? First, we got to figure out where we're going to hit here. Then we're going to draw a line coming off at the same angle, and it looks to me like it's not going to. But looks don't count. Sorry, we just have to work it out, get some actual numbers here. Let's give ourselves a little bit of room and see what we can do. These two, see, this line here and this line here is parallel. They give us that. That means this DC, or pardon me, DE, has a slope of minus 1. So far, so good. I see all these zeros here. 0, wait, 0. That means we could treat, oh, they put a Y up here. I never even noticed that little Y up there. There's so much stuff going on. I was going to point out that we could treat this as the Y axis because we've got zeros here, but they already did that for us. Oh, they're making it so easy for us. We know this is the Y axis here, so we know the Y intercept. For this line here, it must be 6. It's written right there. So the equation for this line is Y equals Y intercept, which is 6, 
So we get minus x plus 6. That's this one here. What happens when x equals 4? That's what it is over here. That's What's the y-coordinate going to be when x equals 4? Well, that's minus 4 plus 6. I'm just going to write it in here as 2. That's the y-coordinate. The j-coordinate, no, pardon me, the x-coordinate we already know is, uh, is 4. So I'll rewrite this point as 4, comma 2. The y-coordinate is 2. Now we're going to come back, since we go boom, 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 all these things are parallel. I think it's fair to assume, and since it has been bouncing as a perfect elastic collision, where the angle of incidence is, angled, is equaled, or is congruent to the angle of reflection at each point, Let's just figure that continues to hold, which means the slope of this line is 1. So for the next line, and I guess I want to erase this, let's draw a line under it. For this line here, we're back to m equals 1. The point 4, 2 lies on this line here, which we don't know what it is yet. I mean, yeah, we don't have the equation for the line yet. But the slope equals 1, so that just gives us an x and the point 4, 2 lies. I don't even need to set up the y equals x stuff here. The point 4, 2 lies on the line. So we have 2 equals, or we have a slope of 1, so it's just the x, 4, plus b. Why are we finding b? Well, because if b turns out to be 0, that means it falls on the pocket here. If b is anything else, then no. That doesn't happen. Well, it doesn't look like B is going to be zero to me. In fact, it looks to me like B equals two minus four or minus two, which is kind of like it's kind of what you would get if you drew this line parallel to this one. You'd come down here. That means we would intersect down here. But that's off the table. It's only going to get this far. Then it's going to take off up here again. In fact, it looks to me, I'm not going to work out the equation right now, but it kind of looks to me like if you hit it hard enough and did this, you guys ought to try that in class. You've got this point right here now. It intersects at the, well, we don't have this yet. But if b equals minus 2, then our equation for this line here is real simple. It's just y equals x minus 2. So, when y equals 0, x equals 2. Cool. Which means this point is 2, 0. And all we have to do is take a line with slope negative 1 that passes through the point 2, comma 0, and show that it'll pass through 0, 2, and that gives us this closed figure here. And if we hit the ball hard enough, it'll just keep tracing out this same path. Although, well, I guess there has to be a limit. I mean, if you hit the ball hard enough to make it do this like 85 times, you'd probably crack the side of the pool table. But you might be able to hit it hard enough without doing any damage to make this actually, to make it go through the whole loop uh, once or twice. It's not really a loop, it's a closed formation, I guess you could say. Well, that's all there was. That's the whole review.
now that you're total experts. And next up in our chapter four will be triangles. Triangles are big. In fact, we're mostly just going to study congruent triangles, which are triangles. Well, you can probably guess what that means, but we'll tell you for sure later. The, uh, the Greeks were really big on triangles. They used lots and lots of stuff with triangles. Later on, we'll read about Pythagoras, who was a Greek. The Greeks did lots of really good intellectual stuff. Geometry, of course. They pretty much developed the logical system of geometry, even though, as I pointed out before, the Egyptians had the results and used them. Greeks also invented democracy, for what that's worth. If you like democracy, you might like them for that. Keep in mind that the Greek version of democracy was quite a bit different from ours. On the other hand, before you start thinking that the Greeks were like the smartest people in the world, they were good at really abstract stuff, because I think they sat around drinking watered-down wine and living inside their heads. They weren't necessarily brilliant engineers or scientists. In fact, Plato was a terrible scientist. When it came to actual empirical evidence, he, he tended to ignore it. He thought you should only think about it. Don't actually perform the experiment, just think about it. But before you get too impressed with the Greeks, I should point out that like most primitive cultures, they had no sidewalks, no roads. It was all just dirt. Naturally, everybody was like that back then. That's no big deal. They also had no drainage, which was totally common back then. Which means any time there was moisture, if it, there was dew in the evening, or if it rained even a little bit, they were walking through a god-awful mess a combination of just trash and sewage. Just a muddy, yucky mess. Now, if they were so smart, why didn't they invent boots? Well, I'll leave you to figure that one out. Goodbye.